I had this idea that when I become really old and feeble, sort of like I am now, I wanted to have an art studio and be an artist for the rest of my life. So I built a 2,300 square foot building in, in my yard. Uh, I, I devoted about an acre of land to a back lot and I created a place where I can do sculptures and paintings and I do mosaics all over the place and I do all different kinds of art and then other people come and they use the facilities here and they create art also. All of basic science is experimenting, and life is, a, is an experiment. It's designed to be lived. And if you did everything that you thought of right all the time and everything worked, I think your life would be so incredibly boring. What impact on my life has film and television production done? I've really enjoyed 3D and 2D and video and film and everything ever since I was in high school when I got my first eight millimeter camera and I, I sh shot my friends at the beach like everybody else does and I started out with that and then I uh, got a Super 8 which they had that had sound and I did a, a couple of music videos back in the 1960s. I had my friends get in canoes and go down the brook were holding their guitars and everything and of course, there was no MTV back then and everything, and that stuff was actually useless, but it was fun to do back then. And uh, then in 1976, I got um, a hold of a Nikagami 350, and I started doing interviews uh, of Canadians in, in Massachusetts and selling that content to the Canadian Broadcasting Company. And I did that for several years in New England until I moved to Florida, and that was, a, that was a lot of fun. In the meantime, of course, I'm obsessed by movies, and I love to go see two or three movies every week at the movie theater and I write reviews about them and I, I tend to be positive most of the time because I really love them. It's hard to really shoot down a movie when someone has put so much work into it. So almost everybody has lots of cameras uh, in, their, in their closet, in their attic and so forth. So over the years, every time I upgraded to a new camera, I kept the old one. And then I realized about eight or nine years ago that I had maybe 40 or 50 cameras. And I, and I said, gee, these things are fun and no one's using them anymore. Everyone's gone to digital. So I started collecting cameras. And then back in uh, about four years ago, a friend of mine was looking through the St. Petersburg Times and saw a little newspaper article about a guy in uh, Greece, a postman in Greece who had a Guinness World Record for the world's largest movie camera collection because he had 500 and something of them. And, and uh, my friend said, I think you have more than he does. And I hadn't realized how many I had bought over the years. But I, I, I went into my uh, garages and sheds and attics and everything and I started counting them. And when I got the 600, I realized, wow, I am crazy. I do have that many cameras. So, uh, so then I applied for and got the Guinness World Record for the world's largest movie camera collection. And uh, now I have over 1,000 different unique movie cameras representing about 25% uh, of all of the different varieties of movie cameras ever made in the world. Kodak came up with 16 millimeter film and reproduced movies in a smaller format for use in libraries. And this is called the library projector. And this is the first 16 millimeter projector uh, ever made. It, it has a little door in the front here and you can put all the films inside. And this case was in libraries all over America. I believe this is 1922 this one was made. In 1923, of course, they came out with 16 millimeter cameras. And as they say, uh, that was the history of it. Now here's what, here is my oldest movie projector that I have. This movie projector was made in around 1898 or so by Alva C. Roebuck and you see it still works absolutely perfectly. Alva C. Roebuck sold out his interest to Richard Sears of Sears and Roebuck and started making movie projectors and his company is still in business to this day. 
and they, they, they made all the movie projectors and all the movie drive-in theaters and all that kind of stuff. And then there's all kinds of projectors in here and cameras. And I don't know if you want to walk down here and take a look at this. Uh, as you see, this stuff may be old, but it still works perfectly. And this is how it works inside. And you can see the mechanism is still in great shape. And this is uh, 105 years old. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of cameras. Here's a, here's a, a keystone. These were called wind-ups, and you wind them up like this. This particular one is 16 millimeter. And you push the button, and you can hear it still runs. And you can take movies with this and, and all kinds of stuff. And uh, and then they, these are these are larger movie cameras that they used in Hollywood for different things and Mitchells and uh, this is an Air, an Airy and this is a Bolex 16 and these are all different different manufacturers. But as you come down here, you will see that these are all movie projectors on this side. other props here like back in the old days they used to use these things here <laughs> to, to for the direction and stuff like that uh, I have interesting pieces around here like this is a, uh, a tiger skull that was actual real tiger skull that was used in the movie Tarzan the ape man in 1932 that this was actually in the movie uh, there's a, a helmet here that was from the movie rocket man and uh, that's how that works. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Inspiration is all around you. The idea is to keep your ears and your eyes open and to absorb and, and, and really see everything. Try to look at all the details. Look at the forest and then look at the individual trees and then notice the, the leaves that are falling to the ground and hearing them. And then look at the squirrels running around and the, and, and the insects walking on the ground and try to actually take the time to slow your metabolism down so that you can see the things that move more slowly because you really become in touch with the, the spirit of the universe and everything around you. Okay, now we've gone over to the studio, the art studio and video studio and what have you, and we can look around here a bit. Uh, right over here in back of you is a giant green screen, uh, which is great for shooting music videos on. This here is a model that was made for Spider-Man 1, which is uh, sort of falling apart now, but it's been around for many, many years. And in the studio here, in the back there, we have a couple of old projectors and, and some trunks and shipping cases and a bunch of parts over there that I'm using to make the model for the 3D uh, time uh, stop motion film I'm working on. And over here, we have the, the actual set, which is all here on wheels, that we're going to make a little stop motion piece with. <coughs> I'm going to shoot this piece using a, a single still camera, but we're going to move the camera back and forth, whatever we determine the interocular distance will be, probably around five-eighths of an inch. And to do this, the, uh, Mark Roberts makes this little device, which you see on, here on top of, the, between the camera and the tripod, and it's called the S3 Stereoscopic Stepper. And this connects up with a cable through the USB bus to the software, which is in a laptop, and I'm using uh, Stop Motion Pro for this project. And then every time I push the button, the camera will take a picture for the right eye, move over, take a picture for the left eye and move back, and it records the information in two files on the computer for left eye and right eye. It's actually quite a wonderful device, and it allows you to, say, use it to take 3D with a single camera, and that way you don't have to worry about slight differences in lenses or cameras because it's the same camera taking all the shots. 
Uh, and then this, this is the set here, and, and well, like I say there will all kinds of be action going on when this is all finally all built up. And this will, uh, and Stop Motion Pro is a, incidentally is a wonderful piece of software, and you can go in online and see how it works. And they, you can have it, you can see a demonstration of the stepper thing. This is this is exactly how Ardman and other companies make these big feature films. It takes a lot of patience to do it. Well, of course, that just seemed to be the next logical step. We started off with color, then we got sound, and then we got black and white, and we got all these different comp options. But 3D was always had, seemed to be like an adds a new dimension, and and it's always been there. But when James Cameron came up with Avatar, and we went to the theater and saw that about three years ago, he. You, you can see the, the equipment that they used and the technique that they used and they used 3D to help tell the story and they didn't throw a lot of stuff out into your face and everything. It really looked absolutely beautiful and I said, wow, I got to learn how to do that. And I tried and of course nobody knows how to do it. You could, at that time, three years ago, who would you ask? So I found uh, a man, Gary Adcock, who was doing workshops in 3D in California. So I flew out to California and I studied for three days with Gary Adcock and at the time he was working on Pirates of the Caribbean 3D with Johnny Depp. He had, he had worked also, was one of the principal photographers on Avatar. So I went to work with a man who actually did this, knew what he was doing and could teach people how to do it. And he, he, he wasn't a theorist, he was the guy that actually ran the equipment. Up until about two years ago, there were no 3D cameras that were made in a professional level. They had little tiny cameras and cell phones and stuff like that. But Panasonic came up with the first actual 3D camcorder. This is not the first one, this is the second one. The first one was the 3AG, which I made my first 3D feature film using. That one was $23,000. Uh, a year and a half later, Panasonic came up with this camera here, which is the Z10,000. This camera here takes unbelievable 3D movies. It is almost the same as the $23,000 one and costs $3,200. So that shows you how much, in just 18 months, the price has dropped. Now, the, the uh, interocular distance is very important in camera design and in 3D production, and that, that's another whole subject. But the $23,000 one had 70 millimeters. This one has, I think, 40 four millimeters distance between the lenses. Uh, so they're a little closer together. But it takes awesome pictures and you can do incredible things. And it is actually two cameras built into the same case, two lenses, everything is double all the way through and records the information in SD cards uh, in frame sequential format on this camera so that it shows the left image, the right image, the left image, the right image. The previous version of this camera, you had two SD cards and it, one of them had the, all the left pictures and the other one had all the right pictures. Then they have just come out, Panasonic, with a, a, a super professional version of this camera, which is about huge big, and it's $35,000, and I can't wait to get my hands on one of those. All artists are naturally creative, and uh, I, I don't know where it comes from, but my mind never stops working. All the time I'm thinking of things. I'm designing uh, coffee tables and lamps and seeing movies in my head and seeing mosaic systems and paintings and whole buildings and cities and it's just, just the way my mind is working for my whole life. There's millions and millions of people and they're all different from each other and what makes them different is all these little variations in how they uh, understand the world, how they sense things, how they, how they uh, interpret things and that, that's what makes it possible for a million people to go out every day and do something different. But because they're all human in the beginning, that they all are doing something supposedly independent thinking people are actually all working to help a pattern which we call society exist. It, it's, uh, it's the order amongst the chaos 
it's a it's it's a wonderful to see it work because everyone says I'm not going to do what anyone tells me today. I'm going to go out and do what I want. It just turns out that what you want happens to be a necessary piece in the overall puzzle.